Welcome to Central News, I'm Amy Forrest. In today's news, a severe flu is on its way to the southern hemisphere after leaving many fatalities in the north and DHBs around the country are urging people to be vaccinated early. Fatalities in the northern hemisphere were due to complications of the flu, like pneumonia, and were more common in the elderly and the young. Waikato DHB's immunisation coordinator, Kim Hunter, says the best way that people can protect themselves is getting vaccinated as early as possible. Uh, absolutely be vaccinated early on in the season is preferable um, before it starts circulating. Um, if you're immune then you can't spread it to anyone else. Good hand washing obviously and um, covering your, your nose and mouth when you uh, sneeze or cough um, and turning away from others. A free trade agreement between Russia and New Zealand may be one step closer after the recent Asia-Pacific Parliamentary Forum. Lindsay Tish, Assistant Speaker for the House of Representatives, attended the forum where he gave a speech titled Promoting Economic Partnership and Free Trade. He says this was well received, but free trade agreements can take years and New Zealand has a great reputation in food safety and food security, which needs to be taken into consideration. We're, we are trying to do a, uh, a negotiations with Russia for a free trade agreement. And what a free trade agreement does is allows access of our products onto their markets without being penalised by way of um, tariffs and tariff is just a tax that's put on for us to be able to export. The public are being asked for feedback on a range of options for the Monganui Girvan Road and Te Maunga intersections. The New Zealand Transport Agency is hosting a public open day on Thursday, April 18th at ASB Bay Park Arena to gain feedback from the public on three shortlisted options to improve congestion and safety at the intersection outside Bayfair and Timanga intersections. In NZTA's Bay of Plenty State Highways Manager Brett Glidden says investigations by the agency have identified that any improvement options undertaken at MGI will impact on the movement of the traffic at the State Highway 2 and State Highway 29 intersection. Kati Kati raised Thai King Wall is getting a big break in the Australian ballet being named the youngest ever principal artist for the company. The 26-year-old dancer was named the 12th principal in the ballet in what some say is a surprise move by director David McAllister. The artistic director made the announcement to the Sydney Opera House crowd during curtain call of a performance on Saturday. Sitting in the house to watch the performance at the weekend were Thai's parents who had travelled from Katikati especially for the occasion. Now for our region's weather. Hamilton, your Thursday sees cloudy periods increasing with a high of 21 and a low of 9. And Tauranga, the sun will be shining for you tomorrow with a high of 21 and a low of 13. Just ahead, women in business. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. If you are a woman in business in Tauranga, you won't want to miss the Business Women's Conference. Hilary caught up with Anne to find out all about it. And tell us about the Business Women's Conference. Oh, it's a really exciting conference we hold every two years now. It's the Regional Business Women's uh, Conference and this year it's Catalyst 2013 channeling change. So it's about those uh, that I, those ideas that you need to to make a change in your own business or the way you're viewing life. So really exciting. A major sponsor for that is Cooney Lees Morgan, a local law firm here in town. And um, on the Friday the 24th of May, Saturday the 25th of May at Trinity Wharf. Who are the speakers for this event? Very exciting lineup of speakers. In fact, one or two of them have made people a little bit jealous. So um, on Friday night we have Garrett Clayton Leslie, and he's a comedian and he'll be our MC. Then we also have Nicola Bell, who is the CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi here in New Zealand, so that'll be very exciting. And she's talking about truth, liars and advertising. And then we start the day with a very exciting speaker, Sir Henry van der Hayden, who was the chair of Vonterra, still on the board there. And he's talking about driving change to make a world-leading company, so that'll be very exciting. 
And closing the day with Catherine Wilson, and she'll be speaking for the love of shoes, and there's not a woman alive that doesn't like the story around shoes and how we get there. So, um, and in between, we've got some very good speakers as well. We've got a panel on exporting, so if you're thinking or wanting to know how to export, and on that panel is Julie Carlson, who was a co-owner of Puma Darts. They're a very exciting export story. Um, we have Carrie White from Wellington talking about how to internationalise your product. She was works for NZT&E. Uh, Tony Palmer, who is chair of Surtees Boats, a really well-known boat maker. And Glenn Dougal, who works for Wave Design. And that's about that support that you need around and that marketing and branding that you need to take your product offshore. And then during the day, the uh, focus on business will be from the legal. Cornelius Morgan is Murray Denya and Mary Hill talking about the legal do's and don'ts about it's not as easy as you think. Mark Lister from Craig's will talk about the exchange dollar and how you manage that. On the other side of those streams, we've got Bridget uh, Peyton Tapsell talking about how you brand yourself, your personal brand, how you make your own brand, and then how that uh, works in the new ma marketing systems, you know, like social media. So then we finish off the day, we're starting with Hearth Health. Yes, Hearth Health, sorry. And that is with the Health uh, Heart Foundation. Then we have Janine Tate, who is from Locks Beauty Salon, talking about the business and science of beauty. And um, so we've got a very exciting day, and I'm really looking forward to it. And what do you think that these speakers bring in particular to the conference? I think the um, when you have those big keynotes that are really well-known people, they bring their story and they make it um, possible. So when I've spoken with Nicola Bell, you know the way she talks about how amazing career she's had. You know she's worked in London and New York and CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi, a world-leading um, advertising company. It, she makes it real. So if you're sitting in the audience and you want to have a go at something, you think, if she can do it, I can do it. Again, Sir Henry van der Hayden, they make that process and that, that the role that they've played real to the people in the audience. And I think that that's really important. And I'm really looking forward to Catherine Wilson and her shoe story. Is the pay equality in Tauranga equal? No. No, it's not. I think in firms where there are equal qualifications, I think it is, but I, it isn't equal in the city. And more importantly, it's not just about pay equality. The, the women in those high executive roles or the women on boards, it's, not, it's just simply not there. It's not good enough. It could be better. Um, I'm not one that says, suggests that you legislate for it, but I definitely think that we, you know, if you look at the five major companies in the city, I think you'd find one woman on one of their boards. If you looked at the senior um, executive roles across the city, it's a very small percentage that are up in there. And that's not about their skills or their ability, it's just that glass ceiling, and it sh it, we could do better. And we could be a leading city that shows that attitude towards that change. Do businesswomen in Tauranga feel that they are appreciated? Um, yes, and certainly through the Business Women's Network here at the Chamber, we make sure that they are, that they understand that their part in business is very important. A lot of these women run and own businesses. I've just ran through several women who are on very, very good businesses that export across the world. So I think they are, are appreciated and we make sure that they know they are good at what they do. What do you think businesswomen will actually get out of this conference? They'll go away energised, invigorated, feeling that they can do it, lots more confidence, networked. You know, that's another really important thing. When you're amongst 150 of your peers, if you're aspiring to go into business, you'll find that woman in the audience that will help you. And so all of those connections are made, and the innovation is always that comes out of this. So when and where is the conference held? It is held on the tw uh, Friday the 24th, Saturday the 25th of May at Trinity Wharf. And if you need and want to register, please contact me at events at tauranga.org.nz. And what do people, uh, business people get out of your business after five events? The um, connection, the inspiration, and knowing that there are other people out there doing the things that you can, they can help you with. I think that's the most important thing. Visit tauranga.org.nz to find out about the Business Women's Conference and for any other events held by the Chamber. Up next, South Korea's ties with New Zealand.
Welcome back. South Korea has had economic, social and political ties with New Zealand since the end of the Korean War in 1953. And recently, Waikato Member of Parliament Lindsay Tish led a delegation to Korea. Lindsay, with close ties to Korea, what was the purpose of your visit? We're just um, uh, celebrating this year 60 years since the end of the Korean War, uh, which uh, was completed in, in 1953. So there's been a special interest in Korea, uh, not only uh, to celebrate the end of the Korean War and the armistice that was created, uh, notwithstanding the tensions are there at the moment, but also we have close ties with Korea in terms of trade, um, social education, and of course there's a lot of uh, Koreans who live in New Zealand now, so it's about building relationships uh, between our two countries and peoples. Because there is considerable unrest in the demilitarised zone between the two Koreas, and I understand that you actually visited the DMZ with New Zealand. Yes, and at the end of January I was uh, taken to the DMZ by our military personnel uh, who were stationed in, in Seoul. And the importance of the DMZ is that it's a four kilometre wide zone separating the two Koreas. But in terms of proximity, uh, the closest point's only 50 kilometres from Seoul, which is South Korea's capital. Uh, and any rocket attack that might come from the north would be there within less than three minutes. So the DMZ is a very important um, gap um, a corridor between the two Koreas to see, keep them separately. And the tensions that are, we're seeing in the news at the moment, uh, are, uh, the tensions are high, security levels are high. And even when I was there in January, I was uh, supported and, and uh, escorted by not only New Zealand defence personnel, but also by United States Marines. And the day before my visit, uh, North Korea had rejected the United Nations Security Council resolution uh, to stop uh, testing because uh, the rocket testing that they were doing was, um, from the Western point of view, was just a test to see whether their rockets could carry nuclear warheads. And so the United Nations Security Council moved resolutions to stop that. Uh, North Korea took no notice. So my visit the next day actually created a lot of interest with photos taken from both sides. What is that demilitary, demilitarised zone like? Is it, is it completely barricaded or is it...? Um, well, there are fencings in part of it. Um, there, is a, there is a line uh, where the crossing is. Um, you can... I've been into North Korea. Um, uh, it's a room where conferences are held and if you walk around the table, uh, you're in North Korea and um, on that side of it you can, I didn't get my passport stamped however, um, but you, one could say one's been into North Korea. But it is a zone that uh, is heavily guarded and there are mines, uh, but also within the zone there are families who have been there for centuries who farm and those people uh, are protected, however if you want to visit them it's very, um, very difficult to get in to visit people who actually actually live in the demilitarised zone. So it's, it's a very barren place and um, uh, it is designed as a protection and a gap between the hostilities which could occur on each side. So it's, a, it's not a place uh, one would want to visit or want to live in anyway. No. Our trade with Korea is increasing, but so far they aren't actually not prepared to take a tr free trade agreement with us. Yes, they? Yeah. We've been in negotiations with Korea for a f with a free trade agreement for some years. And um, it's important from New Zealand's point of view that we uh, get our product into the Asian market. We have a free trade agreement uh, with Malaysia, with Hong Kong, with China. We're the first to do a free trade agreement with China. We're trying with India at the moment uh, and, and Japan. And it, it, what it does is it gives us a level playing field where we can get our agricultural products into their markets without having tariffs on them. And that's the real test, is that they want to put tariffs on to protect their own agriculture. Part of my visit was to actually uh, uh, proceed and to facilitate extra uh, or more meaningful discussions along with our embassy staff and our ambassador in Seoul. What are the chances of us reaching a free trade agreement with them? Well, these things take years. So it, it's uh, the one in, uh, in Russia, uh, the one with um, uh, uh, China took four years 
to facilitate. So these things take a long time. We're trying to do one with Russia at the moment. The same thing's happening there. Uh, we, we opened some doors and part of my visit was to actually get to the key people who make decisions. So from New Zealand's point of view, that was a very successful exercise. They were very engaging, very willing, and I think the visit was a, a very worthwhile one. Our, certainly our, uh, our MFAT staff and embassy staff based in Seoul were, um, were very happy with, uh, my, with my visit. Can you give an example where our products are disadvantaged? Yeah, well, a, very, a classic one is uh, kiwi fruit and uh, Zespri have staff in uh, Seoul. They took me into a supermarket where we had New Zealand kiwi fruit, very well displayed. We had Chilean kiwi fruit, and yet the price, price differential was huge. And people were buying the Chilean kiwi fruit, uh, not as good quality as, the, as, uh, as kiwi fruit, our kiwi fruit, but they were buying those kiwis uh, mainly because of the price differential. And the reason being is that Chile has a free trade agreement with uh, Korea, New Zealand doesn't. They don't have a tariff to pay, we have a 48% tariff. So what we're asking for with a free trade agreement is, is a level playing field. Uh, everyone likes our product, um, but it's more expensive and that's what a free trade agreement would do, it would allow us to compete with other countries on a level playing field and that's what my, part of my visit was about. Up next, Waikato Hospital Updates. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. Patients and staff at the Waikato Hospital have endured months of construction disruptions to their workplace, which are finally starting to come to an end for now. So we caught up with the building program director to get an update on the project. Yes, well, Mead Clinical Centre, which is the um, big building that uh, seems to be going on forever, uh, we're in um, the final stages of uh, the intensive care unit uh, being finished. That, uh, that goes live, if you like. The first patients will go in there uh, in the next uh, four weeks, four to five weeks. Uh, and then stage two will proceed until the end of June. And then we take over theatres. Those are the new theatres. Uh, Mead Clinical Centre, though, still keeps going because uh, it isn't due to complete till uh, 2014. Mm. The other building, the major building, is the uh, Older Persons and Rehab building, uh, and it uh, takes the first patients in about the first week of July. So those are the two major projects on this campus. How is the demolition of the Smith building going? Yes, well, there are two buildings, really, to be demolished. Uh, there's a smaller two-level building, which uh, is the old dental building. And then uh, next to it is the Smith building, which is nine levels. So at the moment, ward demolition, the, um, the, the, the major contractors are dem demolishing the dental building. Then they'll get in and bring their huge nibbler in, the one they use at Christchurch, and they'll start nibbling away at the Smith building. And what do you have to take into consideration when demolishing a building in such a public location? Mainly two to three areas. The, the biggest area is that uh, no rubble uh, gets dropped on uh, an adjacent building uh, because if it does, it, it will you know, hit the roof. If it's big enough, it'll damage the building. We've evacuated patients during this demolition period because there is a ward within metres of the demolition. So um, those patients are being accommodated for probably the next three months uh, somewhere else. Uh, that's the first thing. The second major worry for us is that because our linear accelerators, now they're the cancer machines that people know about, uh, they're adjacent to uh, the Smith uh, building and we've got to be careful that we don't upset the uh, calibrations at that piece of equipment. So far we're going all right, but then we don't have the real big crane here yet. And have plans started for what's going to go in its place? Yes, yes we know what's going in its place. It will be a ward block. Uh, the wards will be um, allied to cancer. It'll also be, probably be uh, cancer services and expansion of those going in this new building as well. But that's a fair number of years away yet. 
probably not till around 2020. So tell us about the Older Persons and Rehabilitation Building. Mm, well, that's uh, 113 uh, uh, beds. They're not, uh, they're not all additional beds for our campus. Um, about um, 50 are about uh, new beds, if you like, or additional beds. But other beds close down to, uh, as we shift patients in there. Uh, it'll open uh, what we call go live, if you like, in, uh, over a period of a couple of weeks. And uh, again, all the most modern technology for the rehabilitation of uh, people, not just over 65. Uh, there are some beds for those that have been in car accidents and need long-term rehabilitation. Yeah, so um, we're looking forward to having that uh, finally finished in um, the end of uh, June. How are the staff enjoying their new wards? Yes, well not only as a wards, because the wards were open February last year, I think it was uh, 2012, uh, but most of their new departments they're enjoying very much because these are the departments uh, that we opened in Mead Clinical Centre. Uh, and then um, at the high dependency unit, uh, that's, uh, that was open several months ago and they're all enjoying it because, uh, you know, it's modern, modern equipment. Uh, they wondered how they got on in their old place. <laughs> and have you got feedback from the patients yet? Yes, we do have good feedback from patients. Uh, not so much from their visitors at the moment because there's, to get to uh, these places, it's often a circuitous route. But that won't, uh, that won't be forever. Just put up with it for another 12 months. And I suppose once that red corridor goes in, that will connect everything. Yes, that's right, when the red corridor is reinstated. Why have you got lined up after these projects? Uh, at the moment we're working on um, uh, bringing together some um, GP services at Tokoroa Hospital. So we're spending about $1.9 million there. Uh, so that's the program we've got uh, going at the moment. Probably then it's quiet for about another 12 months before there are some other refurbishment work start, mental health is, springs to mind. How are the patients and the staff coping with the disruptions of construction? Since 2005 they've been going and I think that uh, they'll probably wonder what hit them when it all stops. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have any news, including your own videos or photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I'll be back tomorrow with more guests from in and around the region. I'm Amy Forrest. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.